Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my high tunnel. I'm really happy to have you here with me today. We are going to get up to some fun in the high tunnel. I have some just work kind of stuff that needs to happen in here. I need to do some pruning on my tomato plants and get them tied to the trellis. You can see on the other side of the trellis, I have tomatoes planted along the side of the high tunnel. And I have the same thing on the other side of the tunnel over here. And I need to tie some yarn on the cross beams there to help to support my tomato plants. For the most part, I plant bush tomato plants. So those are a determinant variety of tomato that usually doesn't get over four feet along the side, but there are a couple of indeterminants, which are tomato plants that are gonna keep growing and growing that need extra support along the side. So we will be using some yarn. Yarn is my preferred method of tying up tomatoes just because it is very soft and I love using something that's colorful and beautiful. This was hand dyed by a friend of mine inspired by Anne of Green Gables, which is my favorite book and, and movie as well of all time. Isn't it gorgeous? with the orange and the green. I just love it so much. Um, I'm gonna be using this just because I love the color and the added whimsy of adding the yarn into my high tunnel, but it's also really gentle on the tomato plants. So we have to get that done. I also have some pruning to do and we'll talk a little bit about that. But one of the fun things that we're gonna do in the high tunnel today, and I am really looking forward to this, is planting my new green stock planter. So I am definitely late to the green stock party. I know a lot of people use these and absolutely love them. I have been wanting to for a really long time, but finally got around to getting one last week. And I am super excited about planting this out. So I'll show you all the plants that we're going to be filling this green stock with. I actually love this so much when I opened it up that I went on and ordered another one so that I can have two. This one is called the leaf. So it's a little bit smaller than um, they're larger original. The other one that I ordered is the original because I want to plant some bigger or plants that need more root space in one of these as well. And I think it's going to look so pretty. So I have these lick tubs. These are protein cattle lick tubs and I use them for uh, planters all over the place. So I already have those planted out, but I want to put the green stalks on either side and I think they're just going to look so beautiful. So let me show you what I got to plant in them. My daughters went with me to the nursery yesterday and helped me pick a whole bunch of fun things to plant. We got some beautiful dark blue. Is that blue? That looks more purple to me, but lobelia. Lobelia will kind of cascade down a little bit and I just think it will look beautiful. So we got some of that and also I got some sweet alyssum too, not just because it's going to look beautiful, but also because the smell is just gorgeous. And when I open up the high tunnel doors, I'm going to get a whiff of this first thing in the morning. That sounds fabulous. We got some beautiful purple lettuce. My youngest daughter picked these ones, some beautiful pans. Look at that pretty petunia. And I loved this coral colored geranium. So we're going to fill this one with a mix of flowers and food. I cannot remember what these guys are, are called. I'm sure somebody out there knows what these are called, but my daughter thought these looked really cool. So we got some of those. These ones, these little tiny tomatoes are called Rapunzel. So they're like a tumbling type tomato. So I thought those would be kind of neat in there. This one is a Calabrochia. <laughs> kind of looks like a little tiny um, petunia, doesn't it? I'm also going to be planting a couple of sugar baby watermelons. It is recommended to plant these ones in the larger green stalks so the original one, but I'm just going to plant two at the very bottom of it so they can kind of spread out a little bit rather than filling all of the cells all the way around. I'll just do two and that way they'll have lots of room for their roots. So I'm going to plant a couple of those. And then they had a whole bunch of really beautiful basils, different kinds of basils that I'm already growing in my high tunnel. So this one is a Thai basil. This one is a purple ruffle. So normally the purple ruffle basil, which I've grown many times before, has just purple leaves, but I spotted this one that has this variegated leaf and I thought it was beautiful. So grabbed that. We have a mammoth basil an Everleaf Basil Spicy Globe. 
and what was this one? Lettuce leafed basil. So a bunch of different basils. This is the perfect green stock for growing herbs. We also have a spicy Greek oregano. That's a really healthy looking plant. White savory here. With the hail from yesterday combined with the really cold weather, the pickling cucumbers that I started myself are not doing great. I've already replaced, I think, 10 of them that got destroyed by frost that we had on June 6th. Wow, it's been quite the year. Um, and then of course the hail from yesterday and then the cold temperatures of the next week. So I did get some more pickling cucumbers to throw out there. I don't know if we're gonna get pickles this year, but we're gonna do our best. So let's get to setting up our green stock. So we're using my go-to sun grow potting soil, which is what I use for everything. I'm gonna flip this box over so that I have kind of a table to work on here. Oh, I should mention I do have a code. It's just LMR10. I'll put a link in the show notes as well too, but if you just go over to the Greenstock website and you use LMR10 code. And the nice thing about the way they do their codes is that they are stackable. So you can use my code with the other sales that they have on their website and I know they have a Father's Day sale going on right now. And I just love this concept so much and I love also that these are North American made. Fill soil to the top. All right, we're gonna do that then. Okay, so like I said, in the bottom here, I want to put these sugar baby watermelons. I have never successfully grown watermelons in our zone 3B with frost dates now in June. So this is the third year now that we've had frost um, towards the 10th or so of June. So for two years, it was on the 10th. This year we had it on the 6th. So we have frosts beginning of June and then we have frost again, usually at the end of August. So very short growing season, but I always like to try every year um, to try growing some things that typically don't grow in my area. I grew sweet potatoes in the high, in the high tunnel one year. I've tried okra unsuccessfully, although I do know other people in my growing zone who have successfully grown okra. You know, I feel like I could probably do three in this. This is quite a lot of space here. I think I'll do another one over here. Except I don't have any more of the sugar babies, but I do have some other things. I have an early dew cantaloupe. I have a muskmelon cantaloupe. And I have, what's these guys? A honeydew melon. I think we'll go with one of these guys. These are the early dew cantaloupes. So these of course are gonna spread all around on the weed barrier here, but that's okay. I have some space. Okay, and now we take one of these trays and put it on there. And then they come with this base. Let me show this to you. So this is what the base looks like and it does turn so that if you do have this on a deck where you have the shade on the one side, you can actually just turn it to make sure that all your plants get sunlight. I'm not gonna have to worry about that here because we're in the high tunnel and there's light all the way around, but that's a super handy feature. I do wanna put this right there and there's also wheels on it as well, but I don't think I'm going to add the wheels to it um, just because of where it's going to be sitting. actually going to do this down on the ground because I have to bend down to that and it's going to hurt my back. Now, what do we want to do in this one? I think I'm going to do lettuce. I just think this is, this is just so cool that you can grow this much food in such a small space. I love it. We are going to be redoing our deck 
uh, around our house. And I was saying to Dan that once it's done, I want to get a bunch of these for on the deck because it would be really handy to have the lettuces and herbs and things that we use all the time that aren't just kind of the big harvests for winter um, planted on the deck, like cucumbers and things like that, right outside the kitchen would be so fantastic. <laughs> Our deck is literally falling apart. Like it desperately needs to be done. There we go. It just pops together really easily. I think we'll go some flowers next. And then after that, we'll put the basil. So these are the watering trays. So you water from the top and then the water comes down and self waters the whole thing, which is, makes them even cooler. I save all of my containers for spring planting of my own seedlings. We had our first company of the summer come and stay at our guest cabin. And I'm happy to say that they had a wonderful time. They said that it was a, just a lovely place to stay. The bed was comfortable, all the things. The only thing <laughs> that I did um, notice and they also pointed out was that there's a window that faces east, which is where the sun rises, of course. And when I was out doing chores before everyone got up, I looked up at the cabin and I was smiling. And then I realized <laughs> that the sun was shining right in that bedroom window and we had decided not to put curtains on the windows because it's it's already very private and the view is so beautiful but it didn't occur to me that probably especially in the summer months when the sun comes up really early that we would need curtains on the bedroom window so that um, just to block out the sun it's high enough up and nobody's going to see in there or anything but um, but just for blocking the sun out and sure enough I mentioned that when they came down I said I'm so sorry we didn't have curtains um, in there but it, it worked out just fine and they had a lovely time so our company just went yesterday, which is why I haven't been posting videos this week. I wanted to take the time to spend with them. And we actually have more company coming later on this afternoon, which is fun. And it's so nice, my friends, to have a space that guests can stay that's kind of outside of the main house. Our house is a very busy, very loud, very active house, which is nice, but for people that aren't used to that, it can be a lot. So to have a space that people can stay that's kind of their own private space is just so incredibly wonderful and I just love it. So I will give you a tour of the Bunky this coming up week so that you can see everything that we've done to it. It's fully set up now and it just looks so cute. Oh, I just love gardening so much. It fills my heart with so much joy. This looks so pretty. Okay, we have, we'll add our other herbs into here. So this one was the oregano, Greek oregano, the savory, put these little dwarf tomatoes in here as well. So they, it does recommend that if you're gonna have plants that are going to hang down and potentially shade out the plants below, that you put those at the bottom um, I didn't do that. <laughs> so I'm going to put them in right here. This is just an experiment for me because I've obviously never grown in one of these before. So we'll see how it goes. Oh, it's so nice that it's warming up in here. I can uncover my peppers when we're done. Okay, so this one is the water reservoir up at the top and there's a hose. So this is optional, this little piece of hose, and it says to attach it to the base. Oh, I see right there. So that the extra water can run off. That's awesome. I don't need that, but that is a great thing. I can imagine if you have it on a deck so that you can run that off the side so the water runs off the side. That's beautiful. I love it. 
Okay, so this is on a little bit of an angle just because the ground isn't even there. So I'm gonna put uh, like a board in on the side just so that it's sitting level. But even with it being on an angle, it's still pretty sturdy. So let's water these. I have a few extra of these, which I'm going to stick over here because this one was looking a little bit naked anyway. It is getting warm enough in here to open up the door and let a little air in. And we can pull off our Ross blanket. Definitely starting to look happier. This is diatomaceous earth here. I have a ant's nest in here that I'm trying to get rid of and it has cut down the population a lot already and probably within another week they'll be gone. This is a 3.8 cubic, <laughs> cubic foot bag of soil and that was perfect for filling this and there's a little bit left over. I actually have a few other plants that I was showing you, the cantaloupes and the melons, and I'm going to go up and get some uh, buckets similar to these guys here and get those uh, planted in some buckets and grow those in the high tunnel as well. It's going to be a jungle in here by August. I cannot wait. There we go. I am going to just water um, these each individual pod just because the soil was fairly dry and so were some of the plants. So let's take care of our tomatoes now. So what I'm gonna do is go along and pull off any of the suckers. So suckers grow out from the main stem and uh, one of the leaves that come off the side. You can see this one right here. So we're just going to pull that one off. In our short season, there is a really good chance that if I were to allow all of these to grow, I wouldn't have enough time for the flowers that would form on those branches to actually produce fruit anyway. So if you live in a longer growing season, you can leave some of those branches on and, um, and get extra fruit, more fruit than I'll get off of my tomato plants. However, it is a good idea because tomatoes are prone to diseases and a lot of those diseases can be mitigated with good airflow to keep your plants pruned back a little bit so that you can have lots of good airflow blow blowing through there. One of the other things that I always do is keep my leaves up quite a bit on the stem. This one um, is branching off and I'll talk about that in a second, but usually like this one here, about six inches or so is good. And the reason that I do that is for the disease as well. So a lot of tomato diseases can come up through the soil. And if your leaves are touching the ground, those diseases can migrate from the soil up into your plant. So it's a good idea to keep your leaves from touching the ground and um, just giving some space so that when these get heavier, they don't bend down and touch the ground as well. You'll notice that this one has one single leader stem coming up and this one has two. Some tomato plants are prone or varieties are prone to growing two main branches. I will let those two branches go and just keep each of those branches pruned nicely. As you can see, we're getting some, as you can see, we have some tomato flowers growing here. I always get lots of questions about pollination in my high tunnel because it's an enclosed space. Do we get bees in through here? And during the daytime, I actually keep both doors and often the sides raised. So we do have pollinators going through here, but because tomato flowers have both the male and female parts, they actually only need a slight vibration to move that pollen onto the stamen of the flower and pollinate the flower. So once these plants are attached to my trellis, I actually can just go along and shake my trellis and that vibrates all of the plants at once. You can go along and just tap your tomato plants as well if, you, if they're not on a trellis like this and that will serve the same purpose. So for tying these up, we're gonna go along, I'm just gonna do one plant at a time. So I'll go along and make sure that it's all pruned, that all the suckers are pulled off and then I'll take our beautiful and of Green Gables inspired wool here. See if I can find the end. And I'm just going to cut a bunch of this and use this to tie up my tomatoes. And then I just tie these to my trellis. And then I'll do that multiple times throughout the season as they grow up. Let me show you what happens if you don't trellis up your tomatoes. So your tomato plant will fall over like this one here 
and when it goes onto the ground, it will actually start to grow roots out of here and those roots will go in the ground. So it kind of vines along the ground. But like I was saying before, because tomato plants are, have a lot of diseases that can come in through the soil, it's a good idea to keep them trellised up. Plus it's a lot easier to harvest and the plants just do better altogether. So I only prune the suckers off of my indeterminate tomato plants, not my bush style tomatoes or my determinant tomatoes. And the reason for that is because the determinant tomatoes, at least the ones I grow are short season tomatoes and every branch will form tomatoes and all those tomatoes will ripen at the same time. And um, it has kind of a limited number of tomatoes it's going to grow that is predetermined. That's why they're called determinant tomatoes. The indeterminate will keep producing fruit as long as the season allows for it weather-wise. And we'll just keep growing and keep vining. So just my determinate or indeterminate tomatoes get pruned. Like I mentioned, I have company coming over a little bit later on. So I actually need to get up to the house because I want to get some yogurt that I've made strained and make a berry sauce to serve as a snack this afternoon. And I also wanted to walk you through how to make yogurt step by step. So let's go up to the house and do that. I'll come down here later and get all of this work that I have to get done, done, and I'll show you that later on this week. And I just say, this makes me really happy, it's beautiful. All right, friends, we are going to make some yogurt, and this is part of a collaboration that I'm doing that is headed up by my friend Michelle from Solely Rusted. There's also some other amazing collaborators that are involved in this, and you can check those all out in the pinned comment down below. One of the collaborators is Rachel from that 1870s homestead who is a longtime friend of mine. We met originally when we both started our channels back in, do you remember what year I started my channel in? 2017, I think? Quite a while ago anyway, and she is just a gem as are all of these other women that are participating in this challenge. So I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step step how to make yogurt using either raw milk, which is what I'll be doing today, or store-bought milk. And if you have not made your own yogurt before, I would highly recommend you try it. It is leaps and bounds ahead of the stuff that you can buy at the grocery store, and it is also super, super easy to make. We are going to start with some raw milk. So this milk was recently milked and it's still quite warm. You want the milk that you're going to be adding your starter to to be 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can either warm your milk up on the stove using a th thermometer and making sure it stays around that 86 degree mark. I'll talk more about why in just a minute. Or you can have freshly milked milk right out of your cow. Or if you do use raw milk, you can also pasteurize the milk and that would mean that you would have to cool it down after pasteurizing it rather than warming it up from cold because you don't want it over that 86 degrees Fahrenheit because you will kill your starter if you do. So like I said, I'm gonna be using fresh, nice warm milk that is at the optimal temperature for making yogurt. I am using some yogurt that we made the other day as a starter. So you can use store-bought yogurt. You wanna use plain yogurt, preferably organic yogurt with live cultures to start your own batch of yogurt. I usually will use my homemade yogurt for probably a couple of months and then I will get some new starter just to reactivate it and get all those cultures really active again because it does start to become weaker over time. At least I find that, but this is nice and thick. You can see how thick that is. Good active yogurt. So we're gonna be using that for our starter. So we're going to start with our quart jar and two tablespoons of yogurt. You can use store-bought yogurt. You can use your homemade yogurt. You can use store-bought yogurt. You can use your own homemade yogurt. Just make sure that it is plain and with live cultures. And now we're gonna add a little bit of our warm milk to this. And we're gonna stir that in really well just to incorporate all that yogurt into the milk. So remember the milk is at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And I actually prefer to pasteurize my raw milk. I just find that the um, raw milk makes a runnier yogurt, which is totally fine, but I like a thick yogurt. And by pasteurizing it, I, um, I get a thicker yogurt. And one of the reasons for that, I think, has to do with the fact that there is lots of natural live bacteria in my raw milk and that competes with the culture. 
But for the sake of today and the sake of making this simple, I'm just going to show you how to do it without pasteurizing the milk since most of you, I'm sure, are gonna be using store-bought milk for this. So we're just gonna mix that in well. So we just have that mixed really well. And now we're going to fill the jar up the rest of the way with our milk. And then we put a lid on it. And there's a couple of different ways that you can incubate this. You can use a yogurt incubator. You can use a, a dehydrator, which is what I use. I have an Excalibur dehydrator and you just wanna set it for between 100 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit. I prefer 110. I find that it works faster <laughs> that way, but also makes a nice thick yogurt at that temperature. You can also use a heat pad, just set on low with a towel over top of it. I've also seen people use insulated coolers, adding a little bit of hot water into the bottom of the cooler, putting your, 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 your jars <laughs> rather in the cooler and then closing it up and that helps it to keep it warm. You wanna have it sit and incubate for 12 to 24 hours, depending on how sour you like it. We prefer 24 hours both for the flavor, the sourness, and also just for how thick it gets, having that long of an incubation period. So I'm gonna be putting this down into my dehydrator. And I want to show you what you can do with a runnier yogurt just to turn it into a thicker Bulgarian style type yogurt. Like I showed you, this is very, very thick, beautiful yogurt. So there's no need, whoops, <laughs> there's no need to do that in this case. But if it was a runnier yogurt, you can use a colander and some cheesecloth and dump your yogurt in it and hang it to drip for a couple of hours and that will give you a nice thick yogurt and then you can put it into jars and sweeten it whatever way you like or add some um, berries or some vanilla or any way that you like to flavor your yogurt. As part of this collaboration, besides just sharing with you some awesome pantry staple recipes, introducing you to some other wonderful creators here on Instagram and over, not Instagram, this is YouTube, here on YouTube and over on Instagram. We are also doing a giveaway, which Michelle is calling a gift away, and there's over $2,000 worth of prizes. And I'll give you all the details on how to enter down in the show notes and in the pinned comment, I'll put a link and it will take you to a page that will give you all the information on how you can enter. There are so many amazing gifts being offered in this gift away, over $2,000 worth of prizes, one of them being a very gorgeous dehydrator that's absolutely beautiful. There is a meat box with, I can't even remember how many pounds of meat, but a lot of meat and then a whole bunch of other amazing prizes, which you can find by clicking the link below to see what we are offering. I just wanted to send out a huge thank you to Michelle for inviting me to participate in this collaboration. I haven't done a collaboration in a very long time and it's been fun to be introduced to some other wonderful creators here on this platform. And on that note, I have to go my friends because our company is about to show up here shortly. I want to get some berry sauce made. All I do for the berry sauce is just heat up some berries, add a little bit of sugar, a little bit of vanilla and let it heat up until it starts to thicken and then have that warm on top of some vanilla yogurt. So I just add a little bit of vanilla to my yogurt. Sometimes I'll add a little bit of sweetening, like some honey to it as well. And it makes just a lovely um, something to offer your company when they come. It's very, very simple, but it's so incredibly delicious. And you know what else I think I'll offer? I think we'll also have a little bit of the lilac cordial that we made together the other day. I hope you enjoyed spending some time with me today, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.